much. And it's really a pleasure to, to talk with your uh, group today. And so I'll talk about collaborative research and childhood asthma. Um, you know, the U.S. is a pretty diverse country, as, as we know, as we're overly well aware of after the last election, probably. Um, but there's been a lot of great research that's been done in individual birth cohorts, um, you know, reaching from coast to coast, but the demographics are so different, you know, in New York City and in Boston and in Madison, Wisconsin and Tucson, Arizona. So there's been an issue trying to uh, really identify findings that are generally uh, applicable. And of course, this is a good reason to put together a big consortium that puts uh, birth cohorts together uh, as, as ECHO has done. Uh, as Nigel mentioned, there's, uh, there were originally four uh, outcome areas with ECHO and there's a fifth now with positive health. And one of them is uh, focused on upper and lower airway disease you know, largely asthma for uh, many of the cohorts within uh, ECHO. And of course, ECHO was established to identify early environmental influences that affect uh, child uh, health and development. So we're one of 31, I think, uh, awards uh, within ECHO. And uh, our award is called the Children's Respiratory and Environmental Work Group or CREW. Uh, there's 12 asthma cohorts, about 21 investigators. Original enrollment in these birth cohorts were about 9,000 and uh, we're, we're still, we're at about 5,500 right now. And it's pretty diverse, you know, a lot in the Northeast and in the Midwest, but uh, some uh, out West as well. And then we have some scientific centers that help us with the microbiome at UCSF, with genetics at University of Chicago, uh, computational science, University of uh, Manchester and Harvard also with um, a, uh, uh, a geospatial sciences group. So, uh, you know, some, some really great research, uh, researchers and, and resources. And we had, you know, several uh, main questions and I'm going to uh, hit uh, three of them today. Actually, I added a fourth if we have time. But uh, one is to identify factors that influence asthma incidence. Uh, the second, what are the relationships between 17Q21 polymorphisms and wheezing phenotypes? And I'll mention that um, 17Q21, as you'll see, has been the genetic locus that has been most closely associated with asthma. And really, we don't know why. So a lot of focus on, on understanding those mechanisms, hoping that that will lead to uh, preventive therapies. And uh, the third bullet, in fact, is how do uh, polymorphisms in this area influence the risk for developing asthma? And I'll talk about one other project um, uh, that relates to viral infections and asthma at the end. So we'll start with um, the incidence project. And this was led by Chris Johnson, who I think many of you know. Chris is just a tremendous uh, researcher at Henry Ford. We're so glad to have her because she really is a card carrying epidemiologist and the rest of us aren't. So um, anyway, uh, Chris led this project uh, to evaluate childhood incidence rate uh, uh, patterns from the ECHO Consortium. And the goal was to identify high risk groups for primary prevention. So the rationale, um, Almost unbelievably, there haven't been any recent studies in the US. Lots of papers on prevalence. A um, couple of incident studies uh, historically uh, were single center or really didn't have a diverse population. Uh, and as we all know, incidence rates are especially valuable in identifying causal factors. So a pretty big gap in the, in the literature. And the goal here was to evaluate childhood asthma incidence rates by core demographic strata and parental um, history of asthma. This was an ECHO-wide project. Um, it was designed as a distributive uh, meta-analysis and rates were calculated by each site. Uh, we, the analysis included 31 cohorts in ECHO, uh, over 12,000 uh, kids up to age 18. The main outcome was caregiver report of doctor diagnosed asthma with age of diagnosis and age specific incidence rates for each stratum and asthma uh, incident rate ratios by parental family history, 
uh, sex and race were calculated. So these are the participating sites in ECHO. So really very diverse and I think, um, you know, approximating anyway, a, a national sample. Uh, you can see lots on the East Coast, Midwest, we've got the South and, and out West uh, as well. So the first thing, and not surprisingly, family history was found to be an important determinant of asthma incidence, especially in the youngest children. So here um, we've got these uh, various age groups. These are uh, harmonized data. Uh, so it was done in, in, uh, in groupings here. And then incident asthma on the y-axis here. And you can see that there's a difference, you know, greater rate uh, in, in the families that had a, in the children who had a family history of asthma compared to those who didn't have a family history. Let me see if I can uh, use the laser pointer here. Um, and the difference is really notable in the first five years. Uh, when you go out to the teen years, not much different. So what happens with the positive family history is that you have an increase in asthma incidence, particularly in the younger children. So subsequent analyses were all stratified by family history. That's the first column here is uh, the, the ones with no family history of asthma. These are ones that did have a family history of asthma. And now we're looking uh, in the top graphs here at uh, sex related differences and then race related differences uh, down below, race slash ethnicity. So um, it's been recognized for quite some time that little boys are more likely to have wheezing and asthma than little girls. And this is really illustrated here in the, uh, the groups without a family history of asthma. And, and it seems to, uh, these lines seem to converge and cross uh, somewhere in early uh, adolescence, you know, about the time of puberty. So boys have more asthma initially, and then the incidence rates go up in uh, girls actually they go down in boys more than they go up in girls in the teen years. You can see this as, as well uh, for the children who have a positive family history, uh, boys uh, predominate early on and then uh, the rates are converging uh, later. So uh, this graph I think is really pretty striking. Um, we collapse some of the groups into non-Hispanic black and non-Hispanic white uh, because the, we had some subgroups there, but they really um, had uh, some, uh, some similarities in their incidence rates. And what you can see is a big difference in kids uh, with no family history of asthma, where the uh, non-Hispanic blacks uh, were more likely to have asthma that started in early life and interestingly, a little less likely to have asthma that started later on in life. Um, th this is really a, a very remarkable graph here though, on, on the uh, uh, showing the uh, rates in children who had a family history of asthma. Uh, the non-Hispanic blacks had just sky high rates in, in early life. So most of, uh, in our wheezing definition here, you know, if wheezing started at a zero to one for us to count it as asthma, they had to still be wheezing at four to five years of age. We know that wheezing can be a transient phenomenon not associated with wheezing. Uh, this is real asthma incidence here uh, with uh, very high rates in, in early life. So the conclusions here, uh, asthma family history, age, sex, and race were all strongly related to childhood asthma incidence rates and that American children had much higher incidence rates, but only during the preschool years, you know, whether or not uh, the family history was positive. And uh, the, the demographic that really had the highest uh, rates of asthma incidence were uh, preschool age male African American children. So this really suggests that to prevent asthma among children at the highest risks, interventions need to be directed toward a very early life. And really, if you look at this, um, you're really talking probably about the prenatal period uh, being uh, key to um, target for these interventions. So let's go on to the second paper. And this one will uh, be uh, testing how chromosome 17Q1221 variants are associated with multiple wheezing phenotypes in, in childhood. So a little bit about this locus in childhood asthma. It's the most replicated childhood asthma onset 
uh, locus in, in European ancestry populations, but the mechanisms are uncertain. Um, there's extensive linkage disequilibrium in Europeans. So over 150 kilobases, there's at least five genes and 10 kind of in the greater area. Uh, but it's difficult to know which genes are functionally related to asthma because of this linkage disequilibrium. And here there's an opportunity because there's a lot less linkage disequilibrium in African populations, suggest, suggesting that fine mapping this region in African ancestry populations could lead to the identification of which gene is closely associated with uh, asthma. So here is the map of the genetic region here. Um, so here we've got about uh, 10 genes that are illustrated. Uh, this is the so-called core region that has uh, four genes and then some flanking regions on, on each side. But you can see that in European ancestry individuals, this core region has really high linkage disequilibrium, which means these you know, polymorphisms really tend to travel in a block. But in African ancestry populations, there's a little bit of linkage disequilibrium uh, with uh, a few key SNPs, but much less than in the European uh, uh, group. So this is a so-called uh, Miami plot uh, that is a, a, a huge study that looked at uh, GWAS of UK biobank data for genetic risk factors for adult onset and child onset uh, asthma. Uh, and it turns out, so the child onset asthma, the genetics are shown, the genetic associations are shown in the uh, blue. And you can see uh, over here, the 17Q12 region is actually the most significantly associated region uh, with childhood asthma. But interestingly, there's really nothing there on, for adult onset asthma. So this seems to be a mechanism that leads to asthma that starts very early on in life and isn't much of a factor in adult onset asthma. And even within childhood, you see um, a, a very early age of onset. So these 17Q1221 uh, 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 SNPs are associated with asthma uh, that starts at age, um, it, during the early school age period of time or even uh, before. So um, I want to tell you just a little bit about wheezing phenotypes, uh, because uh, we know that asthma and speaking even more broadly, uh, wheezing illnesses um, can have many different causes. And so this has led to a recognition uh, that there are multiple phenotypes within this syndrome of uh, recurrent wheezing illnesses. And this was first described by the group at University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, which uh, followed kids uh, through age 11. They now have, they're part of our, our consortium and the kids, the kids are now in their mid 40s. So it's a tremendous uh, cohort. But here we have kids who wheezed early on in life and got better. And then two groups who started to wheeze early on, uh, one uh, who developed uh, IgE associated wheeze and typical childhood asthma. So this is allergic asthma. And then kids who seem to have the same pattern of recurrent wheezing episodes, but tended to get a little bit better you know, in, in the school years. And by and large, they did not have uh, allergies. So this is probably your typical allergic asthma, non-allergic asthma, and kids with transient wheezing that doesn't seem to progress into asthma. So we um, hypothesized that the 17Q1221 SNPs would really be associated with one of these persistent wheezing patterns and not so much with uh, transient uh, wheezing. So to do this, uh, we evaluated parental wheeze reports from seven of the crew cohorts who had kids uh, that uh, were at least 10 years of age. Uh, and, and this uh, harmonization took a while. Uh, we created a new wheeze variable that represented whether a subject had uh, wheezing illnesses in each year of life from birth through age 11, and then used a latent class analysis to identify wheeze phenotypes, much as I showed you on the previous slide, and then tested for associations between specific phenotypes and um, nine SNPs that we typed in, in this region that kind of uh, blanketed uh, the core and the flanking regions. So, um, and here's what we found. So this was the results of the latent class analysis. 
And uh, this study, like many others, has found these kids with uh, transient wheeze. Really, every study that has looked has really found these um, uh, kids who don't really seem to have uh, persisting you know, lung problems. But there are also uh, kids with persistent uh, wheezing. Uh, most of these had allergic uh, indicators. Uh, some of them didn't. We also had a late onset group uh, that uh, where the kids started to wheeze right around the time they uh, went into school. And then a group of kids, the largest group of kids who have little or no wheeze over time. So these three wheezing phenotypes and then uh, the healthy group here. So uh, in evaluating associations with 17Q1221 uh, in children of European ancestry, we saw, uh, th these are odds ratios here, and we saw a broad positivity, especially in these core SNPs that kind of all travel as a block due to the linkage disequilibrium. And interestingly, uh, the um, uh, 17Q12 uh, uh, variants were associated with each of the different phenotypes of wheezing compared to the non-wheezing kids. The transient wheeze, the late onset wheeze, probably strongest for the persistent wheeze, but clearly there were relationships across the board. Now, when we look at the kids in the study who had African ancestry, here it's, uh, you get a little bit more information because again, these SNPs are not traveling as a block and you can see uh, two SNPs in particular, this 2517955, that seems to be positively associated with each of the outcomes a little bit more, you know, probably with the persistent wheeze. And then this other one, this is another core SNP, 2305480, uh, that is uh, probably associated with transient wheeze, but significantly so with late onset and persistent wheeze. So the conclusions here, is that this locus that's so closely associated with asthma really seems to be a wheezing locus. It's not related to childhood uh, allergies at all. Um, one SNP in particular was associated with all three wheeze phenotypes in both um, African-American and European-American ancestry children. So um, we'll go into this a little bit more in the next study, but it suggests the possibility that these associations are driven by susceptibility to respiratory viruses. Again, uh, the wheezing that starts very early on in kids is almost always associated with viruses. So that's an attractive hypothesis, but clearly not the only explanation. So we'll go on uh, to do, um, Carol Ober, the second study of this 17Q12 locus in asthma in African-American children, again, who have, uh, uh, because of the genetic architecture, who are more informative, and, and this time uh, conducting expression quantitative uh, trait uh, locus analysis. So uh, this involved nine uh, crew studies, so 1,600 European American and 870 African American kids. We typed the same nine SNPs here and also use publicly available data from the EVE consortium. This is a large genetics consortium that included over 4,000 European American and over 3,000 African ancestry um, children. Uh, they had seven SNPs that were pretty overlapping with the nine that we had analyzed and um, then conducted gene expression studies. So the so-called EQTL, which helps you to learn which of these SNPs might really be functional, which is related to a change in gene function that could account for this increased asthma risk. So to do this uh, expression quantitative uh, trait analysis, uh, we had three cell sources. So blood mononuclear cells from kids, 85 kids, nasal brushing. So this is a way you can get airway cells. And there have been a number of studies that show that airway cells from the nose can give you insights into um, what's going on with airway cells in the lower airway. And then lower airway cells were obtained from 72 uh, African-American adults in the Chicago area by Dr. Ober's group. And in each case, RNA sequencing was conducted, and this was compared to the genetic data on those nine SNPs to address two questions. Number one, do the SNPs that are associated with asthma also regulate expression of genes within this 17Q region? 
If so, in what tissues uh, does this occur? Again, we had blood, upper airway, and lower airway tissues. So um, this, these are the data, and it's uh, showing separate data for crew, the seven cohorts, Eve, which was that larger consortium, and then a meta-analysis of both, uh, comparing these SNPs and childhood asthma. And, and what you can see is that, again, in the European American in blue, you've got this block of positive findings going across this core region. Uh, in the uh, red um, uh, bars that are marked right here, uh, you can see that there's some differences. And it's these two SNPs, so this 2305480, same one that was in the previous study, and then 8076131, that seem to be positively associated with um, uh, childhood asthma in the uh, combined group. Uh, you see the same trends in all the data sets significantly in the meta-analysis. So these two SNPs are associated with asthma risk. And let's take a look at um, you know, the studies where we connect the asthma risk with the expression um, uh, quantitative trait uh, analysis. So the genetic association with asthma, again, it's these two SNPs right here. Here are the p-values. Um, if we go on and look at the uh, EQTL analysis in blood cells, it turns out that these SNPs were all associated, significantly associated with um, uh, gene expression of these two genes, so GSDMB and ORMDL3 for four out of the five SNPs, and this one in orange was marginal. Um, but you can see that, you know, this pattern of uh, uh, EQTL associations is quite different uh, than this pattern of genetic association with, with asthma. What matched up much better was when you evaluated the uh, uh, EQTLs for the nasal epithelial cells. So here, the SNPs that were associated with asthma risk were also associated with regulation of these two genes, PGAP3 and GSDMB, suggesting that you know, this is really what was accounting for the um, asthma risk. And if we look at the uh, bronchial epithelial cells uh, from uh, the adults at University of Chicago, again, you know, SNPs that regulate uh, GSDMB were most closely associated with um, uh, the, the SNPs that were associated with asthma. So um, the PGAP3 and GSDMB uh, were the two uh, genes that uh, seemed to be highlighted in that previous analysis. And this is just showing the effect sizes here. It looks like this 2305480 has the largest effect size uh, in the EQTL analysis. You can also um, you know, see uh, significant relationships with 8076131. And it turns out that this is a little hard to see down at the bottom, but these two genes are in linkage disequilibrium. So it's probably the 2305480 that is driving uh, asthma risk here. So in summary, you know, by fine mapping um, nine of the 17Q uh, SNPs in African-American children, we were able to demonstrate that asthma risk was associated with only two loci. And the EQTL analysis showed that multiple SNPs regulated expression of GSDMB and ORMDL3 in blood cells, even those not associated with asthma, suggesting, you know, this is not the answer to, you know, what is uh, affiliated with risk. But the two asthma-related SNPs regulated expression of uh, GSDMB and PGAP um, in airway epithelial cells. So these seem to be uh, the candidates, uh, you know, particularly this uh, GSDMB gene, which is a, a gas dermin, is the protein that it encodes. And these gas dermins are really interesting from an airway biology perspective. Here we're looking at um, a cell membrane. This is the inside of the cell up here. And we know that um, gas germans are really closely linked to a process called pyroptosis. And what happens in pyroptosis is that some inflammatory stimuli uh, will uh, activate caspases. You can see there's uh, several different uh, types of caspase, but caspase one and caspase three, four, six, and seven are, are um, uh, known to interact with uh, gas germin B. 
When caspase one cleaves gas germin B, you get an N terminus that forms a multimer and actually forms a pore in, in cells. If you get enough of these pores, the cell dies. Um, and even with just a few pores, you release these pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 and IL-18, which really ramp up uh, airway inflammation. So very intriguing from a mechanistic perspective. And there are uh, mechanistic studies ongoing right now to see if we can link uh, gas germans to pyroptosis to asthma. So um, for the new birth cohort uh, studies, uh, uh, you know, we've identified now uh, a, a great data set that uh, uh, illustrates U.S. asthma incidence data uh, and implications here are that prevention in high-risk groups must occur uh, very early in life. Some new insights linking this uh, 17Q uh, gene locus to the development of asthma. Uh, again, it's, it's very closely associated with childhood uh, onset asthma. Uh, and um, it appears to be a wheeze locus. So the two main factors with early childhood asthma are wheeze and allergy. This really is on uh, the wheeze side of that equation. Uh, secondly, SNPs that regulate GSD and B expression in airway epithelial cells are strong related to asthma. And these findings suggest that GSD and B may regulate epithelial cell integrity and inflammatory pathways in response to infection. And as I mentioned before, nearly all wheezing episodes in early life are due to infection, um, nearly all associated with viral infection, and uh, some of them as well associated with changes in the microbiome and uh, pathogenic microbes. So I'm going to mention just one other study um, at the end here that has to do with infections in early life. Uh, this illustrates what I, I just uh, talked about, you know, little kids who um, develop uh, viral uh, infections uh, in, and uh, with a disordered microbiome, these are the kids who are likely to go on to develop a wheezing illness. You know, viral infections obviously are, are very common and not everyone who gets a viral infection wheezes. There are some genetic predispositions and again, if you get the wrong virus at the wrong age uh, with the wrong microbiome, this can add up to a wheezing illness. Still, most kids get better. There's only a few children who are a subset of these children who develop allergies. And then when they get subsequent viral infections, predominantly with common cold viruses like rhinoviruses, they develop asthma. And then once asthma is established, it's these same factors. So viral infections, allergy, and, and uh, microbes that are associated with acute exacerbations. So we'd really love to be able to prevent these early viral wheezing illnesses in these young kids to see if we could prevent asthma or at least prevent exacerbations of asthma. The challenge is that uh, this is the family tree for rhinoviruses. So this was uh, from about six years ago. I think we've got about 10 more that have been discovered. So there's close to 180 different rhinoviruses. Now you wonder, you know, vaccines are great treatments for viruses as we're finding out with the coronavirus, they can be extremely effective, uh, but um, you know, developing an antiviral uh, reagent or, or drug to, for, anti, uh, for rhinoviruses has been extremely difficult. And you wonder what this great big family tree could a vaccine even feasible. Well, it turns out that um, some rhinoviruses really um, aren't very important. There's three different species, A, B, and C. The B viruses don't cause much illness at all. We usually find them in asymptomatic kids but that still leaves a huge number of viruses to cover with a vaccine. <clears throat> is a vaccine even feasible? Um, you know, there's some data in, in mouse work now that you can put together multiplex vaccines that are very protective in animal models. So Marty Moore at, at Emory put to get together 50 rhinovirus A strains and showed protective antibody responses in mice and monkeys to 49 of them. So if you put enough virus in there, you know, you, you think about it, we have a, a, a pneumococcal vaccine now that covers 23 serotypes. What's the ceiling on that? Well, it appears, you know, at 50, we still haven't hit the, the ceiling. 
Um, Yuri Botchkov in my lab put together a, a, a prototype vaccine with nine RVC strains. And these viruses are particularly likely to cause wheezing in young children, the, the C viruses, and found protective antibody responses in mice across all nine of these uh, uh, serotypes. So um, I, I think in terms of rhinovirus vaccination, we do have a target population. You know, very young kids are the ones who are likely to start uh, wheezing. Um, our group and others have found, um, we identified the receptor for rhinovirus C. It's a protein called CDHR3. Uh, and, and there are actually certain polymorphisms of this uh, gene that uh, predispose you to developing uh, rhinovirus C illnesses and wheezing. So we, we have a pretty good idea who the target population would be. The big question is which viruses should be included. And um, so we um, worked with ECHO and a number of centers uh, outside of ECHO to uh, do the first big study uh, looking at the epidemiology of rhinovirus infections in children. So we pooled rhinovirus diagnostic information from 14 different study cohorts located in the US. This includes uh, five, I think, ECHO cohorts, some from Inner City Asthma Consortium, some from a consortium called AsthmaNet, and then cohorts in Finland and Australia. <clears throat> Among these cohorts, we had um, over 10,000 specimens that had been obtained during rhinovirus infections, uh, and two thirds of those were during illnesses. They had all been partially sequenced to identify the rhinovirus species and type, and we used this data set to address three questions. Number one, does age affect the relative frequency of infections between RVA and RVC? B, uh, the second question, were there differences in serologic responses to these? And then are there certain viruses that are either more common and more virulent and really ought to be in a vaccine? So first of all, these are the 14 studies and what's graphed here is the age distribution of kids in the participating cohorts uh, during the sick visits and during the well visits. And you can see we had a lot of uh, cohorts that had data in early life, which is great because this is when the uh, kids are most likely to get sick, but also kids with asthma can get sick with these viruses. So we had a lot of school age uh, cohorts as well, and then some birth cohorts that had the same kids mo measured multiple times. And probably the most striking finding was that the type of virus that was associated with illnesses really depended on age. So uh, as I mentioned before, the Bs really are not associated with illness. It's rhinovirus C and rhinovirus A. Uh, this is just showing that ratio. So at one, it means you're finding an equal number of infections with those two different species. And before the age of six, you know, when these kids are having the most wheezing illnesses, what you tend to see are more rhinovirus C illnesses. And actually within these, the Cs are more likely to cause the wheezing illnesses. By the time the kids reach uh, uh, their teen years, C viruses aren't much of a factor and you're more than twice as likely to have illnesses with rhinovirus A. So C's look like you know, a good target uh, set of viruses for an early life vaccine. The, I'm gonna show you three sets of findings here. The second striking finding was that when you looked at neutralizing antibody to these viruses, you know, reflecting immunity to these viruses, it was much more prevalent for rhinovirus C, suggesting that this virus is really immunogenic and could be a great vaccine candidate. So this was uh, 20 kids who uh, participated in the COAST birth cohort, one of our uh, cohorts in crew. Each row is uh, data from a single child and the same children, uh, sera from the same children were available from age two, age 10 and age 16. So this is all the same child, just has been in the study for a long time. Um, we uh, surveyed neutralizing antibody responses to three C serotypes and three A serotypes. And really what you can see is that at every age, you know, uh, neutralizing antibody to C was more prevalent uh, than neutralizing antibody to rhinovirus A, despite the fact that A infections are a little more common, um, especially in the, in the later years. 
So you can see that um, you've got about five times the rate of neutralizing antibody at age two, uh, a threefold increase at age 10, and again, about a threefold increase at age 16. Uh, suggesting this virus is very immunogenic and these high neutralizing antibody responses may be why the kids aren't getting many infections you know, in their teen years. And finally, uh, this graph might be a little bit hard to see. <clears throat> this uh, summarizes um, uh, the, the findings from those 10,000 uh, specimens on the x-axis. It's how frequently the virus was detected and um, you know, there's 180 viruses. So um, the uh, expected rate of detection is, is about 0 0.006. That's one over 180. Uh, you can see these viruses over here were detected much more often uh, than some of the other viruses. And actually 10% of the rhinoviruses we never found over this uh, 20 year uh, study. Then the Y axis is, is how often you're likely to find these viruses in sick kids versus well kids. And I mentioned before that rhinovirus Bs are primarily found in well children. And you can see that here, you know, somewhere between two and eight times more likely to find these in a well kid than in a sick kid. Whereas um, these in uh, kind of salmon red color here are the C viruses. And uh, they're much more likely to be found in uh, sick kids. And, and then the A viruses in uh, the blue color there, you can find in both sick kids or well kids. Um, it's a little bit mixed there. But anyway, in, in terms of designing a vaccine, you'd certainly want to include these, these uh, viruses that are found in high, uh, with, uh, with high uh, prevalence. And actually we went back and looked over the 20 year period of time. And for some reason, some of these viruses tend to be around year after year after year. They never really go away, where other ones here seem to um, be present in low um, uh, prevalence uh, for year after year after year. So uh, we're, we're looking at what's uh, behind those differences. So anyway, uh, in terms of uh, prospects for a multiplex vaccine, uh, the target population, I think, has been identified. So preschoolers, uh, kids with a genetic predisposition to these illnesses, and kids with a, a history of wheezing and asthma. In terms of which types uh, could be included, uh, there's uh, somewhere around 60 C types where uh, uh, they're still being discovered here. 10% were rarely detected, uh, and then another 10 or 20% were very common. If you look at the more virulent types, they tend to overlap with the more common types. So there's probably some biology that's underlying that relationship. And you know, the very high rates of, of finding neutralizing antibody to the C viruses suggest that they're very immunogenic and unlike the A viruses, they may induce cross neutralizing antibody responses. So getting back to you know, looking for factors where we need to intervene very early in life, I think you know, this could fit the bill. And with that, I would just like to uh, thank the collaborators uh, on these studies. These, these are the investigators in the crew consortium. Uh, it's a great group. We haven't gotten together for a year and a half. We hope to get together in Chicago this fall, we'll see. And then um, of the collaborators on the rhinovirus epidemiology study, uh, uh, the Carol Ober, I wanna just call out at University of Chicago for leading the genetic studies, obviously funding from the NIH and help from our molecular virologists and a great group at UW uh, uh, Allergy Immunology, Yuri Bochkov and Tim Choi, who led that big epidemiology study. So uh, I'll stop there. I think we probably have a few uh, minutes left over for questions and thank you very much for your attention.